Last year, you might remember, the first Sunday after Christmas was the Feast of the Holy Innocents, when we remembered Herod's slaughter of the children in Bethlehem, an event which is certainly part of the Christmas story, but is a real come down from Christmas Day. Today, we take a smaller step down in remembering the presentation of the baby Jesus at the temple 40 days after his birth. But we're still going in that direction, as you will see. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Here, St. Luke is explaining the origins of the custom of the presentation by quoting from this passage in Exodus that serves as our Old Testament reading for today. Now, the word presentation sounds really vanilla to us. How do you present someone? You say, Frank, this is Joe. Joe, this is Frank. That's a presentation. Now, granted, if you're presenting someone to God, it's going to be more formal. Maybe you'll bring the child to the temple and tell the priest his name. Maybe there's a place where you will hold him up in a ceremonial fashion so that God can formally acknowledge the child. There's probably some liturgy involved, but it still sounds pretty simple. Is that all there is to it? And what does it mean that every firstborn male child shall be called holy to the Lord? And how is that connected to the idea of presentation? I'm a firstborn male child myself, and I'm not going to try to convince you that there's any particular advantage in holiness to being firstborn and male. What does it mean? We need to study the passage to which the evangelist has directed us to answer that question. God says to Israel, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Then it says, You shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. So that begins to answer our question. We normally think of the word holy as being sort of a synonym for righteous, at least when it's applied to a person. But that's actually a secondary definition. Holy primarily means set apart for God, consecrated to God, and hence sacred. This is a sort of a tithe. God is telling the Israelites what his portion is to be, since he will be living among them as their Lord. These animals may seem to all belong to you, but I, the Lord your God, am announcing, hereby announcing a claim on some of them. These animals are mine. And we might say, putting ourselves in the shoes of people who actually own a herd of animals for a moment, in a very real sense, all my animals belong to God. But he lets me use them as if they were mine. So what's different about the firstborn? How can I give them to God in a way that he doesn't already have them? The passage from Exodus goes on. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. That's what it means that the animal is God's and not yours. This is exclusive ownership. God wants you to sacrifice it to him so that you no longer have access to it. Or to redeem it with a lamb. Which means to buy it back from God by sacrificing a different animal in its place. That's with animals. With your firstborn son, you have only one option, since human sacrifice is abhorrent to the Lord. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So this is the root of the presentation practice that Luke tells us about in the gospel. It's not just, Lord, this is Jesus. Thank you for giving him to us. Take care of him. Help us to be good parents. It's, Lord, this is Jesus who belongs to you. Please accept this offering as a redemption price for him so we might keep him for a little instead of sending him directly back to you. There's a sacrifice involved in this presentation. Now, it's not a sacrifice of two turtle doves, as cool as that would be since yesterday was the second day of Christmas. It's not a sacrifice of three calling birds either. The birds that Mary and Joseph sacrificed when they brought Jesus to the temple were not offered for Jesus, 
They were offered for Mary as part of the rite of purification after childbirth. The method of redeeming a firstborn son was different. Initially, as we saw in the Exodus passage, it was to offer a lamb in his place, a lamb to redeem the son. But it was changed later in the book of Numbers when God took the entire tribe of Levi to be for him a redemption for the firstborn of all the nations, of all the other tribes in Israel. They were to serve him as living sacrifices. But since there were more firstborn of the other tribes than there were Levite males, there was also a tax that was paid based on the number of other men to the Levites to help them carry out their vocation. In other words, the presentation of Jesus by Mary and Joseph probably also involved some sort of a monetary payment to the priests. But Luke doesn't bring out that detail, even though he is very careful, as you may have noticed here and really throughout his gospel, to explain Jewish practices to his Gentile readers. He doesn't just tell you that they're going up to Jerusalem for the presentation. He then quotes the part about every male that comes out first shall be holy to the Lord. He doesn't just tell you that they're going to offer a sacrifice. He tells you that it's two turtle doves. He's explaining things to his Gentile readers, but he doesn't explain anything more about the presentation. He doesn't tell you anything about anything being offered to redeem Jesus. Now, I'm sure Joseph and Mary did whatever was required of them by the law. And Luke does make a point of telling us that before they left, they performed everything according to the law of the Lord. But I think it's intentional that he doesn't give us details of any sacrifice except the one offered for Mary. Because looking back from the death and resurrection with the big picture in his mind, Luke understands that Jesus is fulfilling the law not just by obeying it, as his parents are when they bring him to the temple. Jesus is fulfilling the law also by completing and transcending it. Jewish parents were supposed to redeem their firstborn sons from God. But Mary and Joseph could not really buy Jesus back from God, no matter what they offered. They could not redeem the Redeemer. Jesus is the sacrifice. You can't substitute a sacrifice for Jesus. He has been born to save his people from their sins. He has been born to die. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, Simeon told Mary. No other offering can be substituted. To offer a sacrifice to redeem him from God so that he can live a normal human life and pass on the family name would be to miss the point completely. He himself is the sacrifice and must be so that he can redeem his mother and Joseph and all of us from death. When God first instituted the redemption of the firstborn as part of his law for Israel, he tied it explicitly to the deliverance from Egypt, especially to the 10th plague, which finally forced Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. In that plague, as the Exodus passage tells us, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. What exactly is the connection here? Well, we know from just a few chapters earlier in Exodus that when the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, he didn't actually kill all the firstborn in the land of Egypt because he had given Israel a way to escape the plague. He had told them to sacrifice a lamb and mark their doors with the blood and eat the flesh that night in a way where they're prepared for a journey. And all the homes that were marked in that way were spared. Now, why does our reading say all the firstborn when everyone knows that that is what happened with Israel and that their firstborn were spared? It's because the whole land of Egypt fell under that curse. The Israelites were not spared automatically just for being not Egyptians or because they lived in a different neighborhood or because, even because they were the people of God. Israelite firstborns were spared specifically on a house-by-house -house basis based on the blood of the lamb on their door. God is telling them, I could have taken your children too. You are not righteous. 
You're not so much better than the Egyptians that it would be right for me to punish them, but wrong for me to punish you. I saved you because of the Passover lamb who died in your place. I allowed you to buy your firstborn back with the life of that lamb. And now, so that you will remember this throughout your generations, and remember that it continues to be true in every generation, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And in our gospel reading today, Jesus fulfills this stipulation of the law as surely as his parents fulfilled it by presenting him, but in his much greater way. Why did God claim the firstborn sons? not only of his enemies, the Egyptians, but also of his people, Israel? And why did he communicate this frightening claim by calling them holy to the Lord? There were reasons on the ground in the history of the Exodus and the history after that, as we have mentioned. But Jesus Christ is the final reason, the one that explains everything, makes it richer and more wonderful in sense than it was before. Because Jesus is the firstborn son, par excellence, in a way that surpasses all human primogeniture. Jesus was begotten of his father before all worlds. God of God, light of light, very God of very God. And since his birth and resurrection in the flesh, Jesus is also the firstborn from among the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. God claims Israel's sons as holy in order that he might one day claim his own holy son in just the same grim way and offer for him no redemption, but rather make him the redemption for all those other sons and all those other daughters and, in fact, the whole human race, that Jesus might be the true redemption, the universal redemption, worth more than every other son of man combined. Jesus will die as Egypt's children died. And then he will live again as Israel's children lived. And in order that Israel's children might live, and that we might all of us share in the identity of God's firstborn son, his heir, our Lord Jesus Christ, who was born in Bethlehem. That is the meaning of the command to redeem the firstborn. And it's why we don't have to do it anymore. It is completed in Christ. The firstborn of God has become the firstborn of Mary. And all of us sinners have gained the perfect lamb. God buys us back from himself. The mercy and the humble sufferings of God redeem us from his righteous wrath. And Simeon and Anna rejoice and prophesy to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. To the saints before the altar bending, waiting long in hope and fear, that the Lord has in fact descended and has appeared in his temple in the guise of an infant. In the name of Jesus, amen.